It is with great pleasure that I welcome to our program Professor Dr. Ralf Frank, a member of the German chapter of the Club of Rome and a key figure in sustainable leadership in Germany. Ralph, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to our program. Uh, thank you for your kind words and a uh, pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be talking with you after all these years. And uh, thanks for reaching out to me. Uh, happy to talk with you. So. Thank you so very much. Uh, the reason we, we actually met, uh, I think about 10 years ago uh, within the context of integrated, uh, the integrated uh, fine reporting initiative that was started by Prince Charles. And uh, so you and I have been around the block for quite some time and it is with uh, great surprise and uh, anticipation that I am witnessing uh, the developments of the Green Deal, Green Deals, I should say, around the world. Uh, in at the EU level in, in China, in the United States. So, but before we go into this, I'd like to get to allow our listeners and watchers to get to know you. What happened in your life that catapulted you onto this uh, sustainable finance, sustainable everything? Well, that's, a diff that, that's, that's not, not easy to answer as a, as a question. I guess uh, like many other people, People and many much better educated people like like, like me, uh, I felt that uh, the way that economics was being, how should I say, enacted, if you want, lived, there was something missing. And uh, I actually got interested in, in environmental affairs uh, at, at an earlier age, much earlier age, um, around the you know the, the my 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 twenties, the twenties uh, years when. It became obvious that um, a new movement was beginning, uh, the green movement in, 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 in Germany, but not only that, also in environmental Greenpeace, uh, Brand Spar and all that. That was just some, some early, early signals that I witnessed. And when I uh, later on started working for a professional association of fund managers and financial analysts, which typically uh, that, that which is typical for a professional association, you tend to have something like a conception of a syllabus. So, in other words, a syllabus that answers the question, "What is it an investment professional, so in a fund manager, a financial analyst, what is it they should know? What is it they should be able to do?" And it, I, it it dawned on me when I looked at the syllabus that something was completely missing. Something that was already around. We're speaking about two thousand two, two thousand three. Uh, so if you want, almost 20 years ago, uh, it was clear that uh, some uh, of the topics we now know under the name of ESG had already been around. It wasn't called ESG then. Um, I, I, and I came across a book that was called Environmental Economics, and I, that sort of that caught my attention. I, I, can, I can remember that. And so uh, it, as, as early as 2002, uh, I started looking into what is it that stops investment professionals from actually uh, using the CSR reports. Some companies had CSR reports. There was a uh, an early version of uh, GRI was around. So some companies actually had started reporting and they came to me and said, why don't investors use the data? What's happening? What is wrong? So we started looking into this. And at that stage, I remember we called the the information that we were looking at that we were asking, why doesn't it go into investment decisions? We were, we were referring to it as non-financials. And, uh, and, and some of the, we we'll call it extra financials. And, and later on, someone invented the footnote that when you, whenever you said non-financials, uh, you, you meant that these uh, informations, key performance indicator or whatever, were not part of the primary financial statements. And that was the reason they were called non-financials. I remember us arguing ever so often to sort of say, just because we call it non-financials doesn't mean it is doesn't have financial impact. So that's what got me started later on. I started uh, conducting my own piece of research, um, behavioral economics. I was uh, it, it, behavioral economics is like it's probably the wrong thing to uh, thing to say these days, like a virus sort of spread, and 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 I got infected, and I, um, being a sociologist uh, by by education, I, I was very fond of um, some of the key messages of behavioral economics, especially, especially behavioral finance, uh, as a breed, the humans, you know, cognitive deficits, laziness, overconfidence, some of the things, if you take a close look, I don't have to tell you that you, you've taken enough close looks at the financial markets, but 
Um, a concept like overconfidence confidence is omnipresent in financial markets. And my idea, and even today I sort of follow that, um, that are some of these assumptions and, and the idea that, that there are some cognitive biases at work, including overconfidence, including confirmation biases, and some of the other nice biases we know since Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman which human uh, actors, are, economic actors, are being prone to. So that's that's where I'm right now. I'm I'm working in organization transformation now, which entails uh, sustainability. But not only that, there's also another topic that I find is it is almost bleeding obvious, if I can forgive my French, that technology should enable us to make progress with a topic like that we now refer to as ESG. Uh, which, if we're really being honest, it took us far too long to make progress with that. We'll probably discuss that, why financial markets were so slow, why didn't they pick up on, 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 on ESG and embed it, why all these questions and, 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 and all the, the, the disbelief that ESG would express something. I'm, even today, I, I, I have to admit, I had a, a session yesterday with the Corporate Reporting Users Forum, which is a network of investors. And there were still some people trying to force, enforce the argument, the economic profitability is the only, only thing that matters about a company in the year 2021. Anyway, Mariana, I could go on like this forever. And you've been part of, you, you've been also, we've been part of the same community of people who try to change something and, often frustrating. I mean, if, if we're being honest, I don't know, for you, for, I can say for me, it's often been very, very frustrating to see that so little progress was made. Now we, now we have to, you spoke about the uh, Europe's man on the moon, um, you know, the uh, EU action plan on sustainable finance. Is it good? What does it do? Anyway, I'll stop here. I wanted to give you the opportunity to to chip in because I, I'm pretty certain you have something to say on that. Right. I, if there is something that characterizes me is I never give up. <laughs> and so are you. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this conversation. So I, I have chosen to label the current green initiatives worldwide starting with China, followed by the EU, and, and now, thank God, the United States, on their efforts along the, the Green Deal, whatever that is. So for, for me, this is a wonderful movement in the right direction. And the question for, for this session is how, first of all, because, it, because we are in Europe, because we live in Germany, because we want to, to change, can you please give us an insight? What is the, what's called the SWAP, <laughs> the Sustainable Finance um, Action Plan of the EU Commission? What exactly is it? Um, then what does it entail? What are the aspects thereof? And then I'd like to lead move on toward what we could do, particularly within the context of the investment turnaround from an early stage investing, which is my area of expertise. What can we do and how can we help those who are already there, who are ready to do what's necessary to implement okay. it now that we have the legal background to do, to do so? Well, let me just first of all say one thing. The Sustainable Finance EU Action Plan, whatever we call it, let's just say the EU Action Plan, uh, it is bold. And I was very skeptical in the beginning, uh, but I've been convinced that if there was ever a right way of tackling some of the issues, then it would probably look like this. Now, we can discuss of, of some of the elements, especially the taxonomy, and uh, we know that there are efforts underway in some other piece, uh, parts of the world, like uh, in, in the UK, uh, probably in the US. I heard that China is looking into this. I haven't seen every, ev any evidence of that, but that, there will, that, that we may end up with something like a competition of different taxonomies, which is probably a natural thing to happen. And we shouldn't be surprised uh, because it, it, the, the taxonomy is probably the, one of the most political instruments that 
uh, there is in the toolbox of the EU, EU action plan. Now, the EU action plan is consists of uh, 10 different activities. Some of them were some, as we would tend to say, low hanging fruit. Uh, when I think of some of the index regulation, it was already uh, something that was there to be had and the uh, sort of the EU, EU endorsed it. The same probably with green bond standards. Uh, we've seen a lot of green bonds out there. There's Enigma standards. So uh, what I'm trying to say is some of the elements of the EU action plan are really brave and um, uh, a, a massive step forward, while others are probably more something that was uh, lay along the way and we ju they just grabbed it. To me, the core piece of, um, of the EU action plan is in fact the taxonomy. The taxonomy for climate, that's one thing that is often forgotten. Um, if we're really being precise, then the EU action plan is not so much on sustainable finance, but climate finance because there are some other pieces missing. Uh, if you think of uh, um, a circular economy, if you think of biodiversity, now that's, uh, that I hear is in the pipeline that is coming. So it, there will probably be more than just the one type of uh, taxonomy. There will be probably a biodiversity taxonomy, which is, by the way, something I consider very important. Biodiversity is key. Um, but we, now we, we started the EU, started with uh, climate, which is probably there, uh, very important. And to me, the taxonomy is the kind of yardstick. It has the approach to measure what kind of economic activity can really and truly be called green or climate enhancing or whatever, and what is detrimental. Now, uh, we've, we've seen that... Um, uh, the some parts of the industry have actually adopted that approach, and I know of some large-scale global companies, blue chip companies, who are actually scanning their product portfolio, trying to figure out uh, at the level of an individual product, is this something that's compatible with the taxonomy? Yes, no. I think it's, especially the the one principle that goes with it, do no significant harm. I think is quite interesting. Now it came to the crunch uh, this year in April. Uh, and there's a big white elephant in the room. Everyone knows that nuclear power, nuclear energy being sustainable, being regarded sustainable in France, uh, being uh, regarded highly unsustainable in Germany. And everyone knows uh, the EU cannot uh, actually publish a taxonomy that disregards French, uh, a large part of French, uh, French culture. At the same time, it cannot possibly declare nuclear power as sustainable when the German government, regardless which government will, will have, and as of September, will not sign off to that. So they've, they've come up with some political answer to that. But any other than that, the taxonomy, to me, is a very important instrument, and a very important instrument, regardless whether there will be a British, a, a Chinese, an American taxonomy, it is the approach to measure what is actually compatible and what does harm and what doesn't do harm. So that is to me the key. That is to me the key part of the uh, uh, EU action plan. There are some other um, uh, uh, parts of it, like the transparency directive, uh, that is looking at, from my perspective, at exactly one of the players who who uh, always thought uh, of him herself as a bystander at the finance industry. You know, being um, it is it is. And I can understand the, the, the motivation behind that. It is relative, it, let's just call it unfair to regulate companies and enforce CSR disclosure and enforce uh, auditing of CSR disclosure and whatever else that comes with it. And then you have, let's just say, uh, a bank with a large credit book and they don't have to disclose what's in their credit book. I, I, I'm, to be perfectly honest, I'm surprised that companies uh, didn't step up to the plate much earlier to sort of demand that banks should uh, open their books. Now, this is in the making. I've taken a closer look at some of the regulation that's, that has been published by the European uh, Banking Authorities, the EBA and the uh, and ESMA. And there's a lot of, um, perhaps from my taste, a little bit too much data granularity in there, but the general direction is excellent. For instance, if you look at banking regulation, which is now becoming the flip side of, of regulating uh, companies, as they say, from the real economy, 
uh, for each of their uh, companies having a credit or taking a loan um, or publish, uh, issuing a bond, uh, banks will have to have in their books a so-called green, uh, green asset ratio. Great. Green asset ratio, great because it shows you how green that credit book actually is. But also, it's also great because it only needs, it only requires three indicators. That's green turnover, green, green capex, green opex. Now, no one can say, uh, pro, I, I can, I can hear already voices uh, of people who say, this is not the whole picture of, of, of uh, whether a company is green or not. I would say, uh, let's just uh, treat these three uh, indicators as something like markers. If you know that a company has uh, about 80% green turnover, it allows you as an investor to ask questions. Uh, you don't have to know um, what is their customer satisfaction index, uh, what is their employee engagement, and uh, what, what is their carbon footprint. You may want to know that, but uh, the three indicators, green capex, green opex, tell you whether a company is actually doing something and whether they mean what they say. So it, it is in what psychologists would call behavioral integrity. A company just, not just reports to be green, but they are actually act green. So that is good. And now that this is reflected in banks' um, uh, credit books uh, at, uh, to my surprise, a very, very high level of granularity, I think this was, will tell us very soon which of the banks have the highest risks in their books? Because there is this concept of double materiality that uh, the uh, EU also promotes, which I believe is, is absolutely necessary. So it is not so much uh, how much brown do you finance, but also if, it, if the industry gets more brown, how does it actually affect your credit books? And finance is too important to leave it to bankers. So to me, the, the EU action plan is uh, a good piece of work. Uh, you may might want to say it's taking them long, long time. Yes, okay, that's that's what politics is about. There are a couple of issues where it's like a, like at a children's birthday. You know, you have several children at the table who want something special for them. Uh, you know, and and the European Commission is very likely to sort of. Uh, um, give it to them because they want harmony and everything. It was clear right from the start that some of the um, energy supply strategies of some of the, the, the member states of the European Union are highly unsustainable. And we should call it that. You know, it's, it's, I, I don't think it makes sense to, to, go, uh, uh, to go to extremes uh, by to energy transition when you know that some of your neighboring countries are still uh, using their nuclear power plants who have been outdated 20 years ago. You know, do we want that? No, we should, probably shouldn't want that. So it's, it's a brave undertaking to answer you, your question completely. It's a brave undertaking. It's the transparency level that is probably a part of hygiene. To me, the boldest move is, again, to introduce a taxonomy and to have probably more taxonomies come in. Right, so thank you so much. Let me summarize a little bit. First of all, I'd like to, for those who are not familiar with the abbreviation, CSR is corporate social responsibility, is something that's been around for quite some time. Corporations like Volkswagen have reported and got prices for their corporate social responsibility uh, the declarations. Uh, and we know in retrospect how much they lie to all of us. So um, it is important that now we have regulation and not just declarations. So the, um, the EU Commission's uh, financing uh, sustainable uh, growth can, entails three aspects. One is that the, the taxonomy it like is the declaration of what can, constitutes a green deal. And there, they have uh, several areas, five of them, uh, but only two right now are in the focus. They, uh, the rest like circular economy has not been defined. The focus of the taxonomy declaration uh, entails climate change and climate adaptation. Uh, factors. It doesn't look at the circular economy or the marine life and uh, or biodiversity, the, the biodiversity and uh, prevention and uh, um, and so on. Um, num the second uh, aspect of the of the EU Commission plan con constitutes the disclosure criteria, uh, which enables um, um, co companies to uh, to see what to to see what is actually 
uh, in the supply chain, well, with whom they are um, uh, dealing with, the, uh, how much they subscribe to the uh, necessary uh, regulation. And uh, the third aspect that you spend time on is the transparency, which is extremely, uh, and transparency and disclosure are the same. Uh, what is, um, what is, uh, is the benchmarks is the other third aspect. Because how do you measure? We need to co concrete benchmarks as to how we know whether or not we are achieving those goals. So this is the third aspect. And, now, and how we make progress, not to forget uh, that progress uh, yeah. within the same investment from period A to B to C and so on. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So thank you for that. That's, uh, that's very, very important and uh, important information uh, for those who um, are listening right now. The, our audience is mostly business angels, venture capitalists, um, impact investors, and entrepreneurs who would like to know, well, how to gather the capital from those who actually get it. Because one of the things that is currently happening also is that the capital that has been actually supposed to flow into the market and supports, uh, supposed to, uh, to uh, go to those entrepreneurs who actually know what they're doing and want to implement these things, is not reaching them because the banks are deciding whether or not who, des who deserves to get the, cap the capital or not. So they're still finding ways to, uh, uh, to uh, better ways to get uh, money from business angels who uh, are not banks, who uh, decide on, uh, on how they invest their own money or not. So it's an easier way to still make your dream come true. So back to the audience. We if you are a business angel uh, or a family office and you, you're not a bank, you're not regulated, but you still want to start a venture capital fund that is ESG compliant, compliant with the Green Deal, what, what would you tell such people? How, what is a venture capital ESG fund? How to implement them? Uh, what are the areas uh, that um, we need to focus on? And also from my perspective, you know, how does that relate to technology? I'm an artificial intelligence, I'm a computer scientist expert. Uh, I am investing in, in, uh, in exponentially growing technologies that are in line with, uh, with uh, UN SDGs and uh, planetary boundaries. How, what would you advise us? You know, what kind of fund what are the structures? What are the areas that we should be focusing on? Well, I would leave to. I would like to to start with one thing, one observation. Um, most of the, as you quite rightly put it, the disclosure and transparency efforts that are part of the EU action plan will not make a big difference to many of the kind of investors that who you mentioned, venture capitalists or business angels, basically because uh, these, these disclosure standards refer to, um, to, to assets that, that they're not invested or not even interested in. Uh, and um, from a psychological perspective, I would like to say, uh, even add one thing, um, um, there is a almost like a blind belief in, 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 uh, in, in, in the, the, the strength and the power of more data. Now, I'm not denying that you, you want to see, uh, uh, you, you need a specific level of transparency with regards to your assets, but um, more data, simply more data. And, and some of the stuff that comes from, from, from the EU, and by the way, also from other um, initiatives, is simply asking for more data. Uh, a good example of, uh, of, of one that, that I personally like is the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, because there is the question, something, Mariana, that you and I probably uh, intuitively love when someone says, you want to integrate sustainability into your governance, your strategy, and your risk management, because that's when it gets serious. But anyway, this is big banks. These are big, big companies. Let's just uh, look a little bit at, at what is it that people... Uh, with the idea of a venture capital fund can do? Well, first, I see, see two things. So one of them you already mentioned, that's technology. And the other thing that I see is uh, how to select the right investments. Let's just start with the latter part, how to select the right investments and, and, and what to do about that. Um, you cannot expect a small company uh, that is asking for venture capital to have the level of 
uh, granularity details and infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure that we know that larger companies uh, would have uh, if you, for instance, think of a CSR report and that. So trying to figure out what kind of company am I dealing with, which is from my perspective, part and parcel of, of uh, venture ca um, capital. How, what, what, is, what, are, what are the future opportunities of this company? How does it grow? How does it actually make money? And how is my venture capital actually helping them to grow into specific um, uh, dimension? So um, the a good question is, uh, is that, that assets, that company, that venture that I'm looking at, how does that actually compare to the EU taxonomy? To the, the one that we already have and the one that we will have. So in other words, asking the question is, is it addressing a problem that has to do with climate change, climate mitigation? And while it is doing that, um, is it providing significant harm to some of the other uh, four uh, environmental targets that the EU has defined, like circular economy, which is yeah, just to, to give give um, your audience an idea, which is uh, exactly where the uh, the uh, debate about nuclear power comes in. Nuclear power is carbon neutral, as we all know, but the nuclear waste. That is part of the problem. Now, this is what where it does significant harm to the circular economy uh, target that the EU has. That's why why you, you could say um, you cannot you cannot you shouldn't invest in nuclear power. By the way, another example that's lesser known is uh, given the taxonomy. I'm thinking about water, uh, hy hydropower. Often, where you see where hydropower is being installed. Uh, there is a, a, a very massive lack of biodiversity after that. So again, this is something where uh, dyed in the wool green, so to say, would sort of raise their finger and say, don't do that. This is not compatible, compatible with the taxonomy. But I was always wondering, now that I'm working in Potsdam and so close to the Berlin startup scene, uh, and 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 there are an awful lot of number of fintech companies, not just in Berlin, so all, everywhere around the globe. And there's a German fintech award. And I, I've been very close at once at one stage in my life to fintech companies. I had a lot of insights, and it's always occurred to me that there are very few companies looking at sustainability as a, a business opportunity. Now that's where probably the, the other part that you mentioned technology comes in. So the first one is selection of ventures. Do they have to say, are there ventures out there that have something to say about uh, the environmental goals that have, that have some contribution? Um, I remember a couple of years ago, um, um, there was talk about green technology. Now, whatever happened to green technology? Is green technology actually being financed by venture capital? Are, are there actually firms around for green technology? I don't know. I, it's simply, I, it's, honestly, I don't know. I haven't seen a lot of them. What I've seen in uh, when startup companies uh, present themselves at conferences, I see blockchain. You know, you want to compare blockchain to the taxonomy. I think uh, we've got a loser here. Um, as, as far as I know, um, but some people ex explain to me that blockchain has a future and blockchain will consume in the future much, much less energy uh, than what it does today. But to me, the, the question is, when I see blockchain, when I see um, a virtual reality, artificial intelligence uh, 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 reality being exploited commercially, for instance, for some marketing technology, what's often referred to as user experience in the industry. How about the user in this, uh, experience in terms of energy? Um, how about uh, uh, waste? How about water consumption? Um, that to me seems to be uh, a huge gap, uh, for, which isn't addressed for, for perhaps you know, I, I don't know why, for whatever reasons, but if I was a venture, uh, uh, if I was managing a venture capital fund, I would look for for some of the technology, some of the ventures that used, utilized technology, especially digital technologies, in order to make a better, more compatible life. And if I was to measure, you just mentioned that is probably one of the most important points to have a benchmark, what to measure against. And I would say I would measure against the um, taxonomy. So that's what I would do. Uh, chances are that there are that the, the pipelines of ventures like these are not very full. 
Uh, so that brings me then back to now that we are talking a lot to the startup scene in, in, in Germany. Um, the, the, even the German market it was a latecomer, but it's not short of entrepreneurs. I can say that. And young managers, typically male, but some of them, there's also the fintech ladies, which is a, a nice um, group of uh, very powerful uh, female leaders in, 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 in uh, finance technology. Um, and, and these entrepreneurs, so my question is, what would we have to do? Uh, is, it, is it something like, have we, do we have to go on a mission? What do we have to do in order to, um, to get them more interested in something that they, that they are behind anyway? When I speak to younger people, I have two sons in that, that age, mid-20s. Um, that sort of, I would say that was green by nature. Many young people uh, that come to our business school uh, tell us that they don't want to work for companies which are known as uh, to be in, in, in you know, the notorious industries like oil and gas and, and coal and, and, and mining and stuff like that. So th there is something happening. Greta Thunberg, they're probably closer to Greta Thunberg than, than I could ever be. But it sort of doesn't translate in the kind of business ideas they generate. I don't know. That's that's maybe maybe I'm completely wrong there. But it's just my uh, my uh, observation and my perception. Although uh, there are excellent approaches out there by the World Economic Forum has an excellent uh, summary of business models that apply to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So I don't think it's it's not so much. Um, it's not so much the, the lack of ideas by entrepreneurs, perhaps there is a lack of certain appeal to certain investors. And that's why we we'll sort of have come full circle here. I don't know. I'll stop here before I say something wrong. Well, you address several um, extremely important points. One is how does an entrepreneur realize, you know, whether his or her idea or company uh, complies with the EU uh, Sustainable Finance Action Plan. How do you decide that? And you mentioned before also uh, the, the Global Reporting Initiative, uh, because we don't have standards. That's the problem. Uh, had we had developed standards thus far, we would be in a much better place. So in our uh, business angel uh, activities over the past 30 years, we not 30 years uh, since we started, but over the past couple of years, we sent them to, uh, to B Corp where they could go through lists and, and make assessment as to what it is in their enterprise that actually complies to what rules there. You know, we, we could, I think they could, they use gears uh, um, uh, and they also use uh, the IRIS uh, standards. We also have the what, 272 UN SDGs. So there are several ways of guiding entrepreneurs to find out how compliant they could be uh, or how sustainable they could be. My question mm -hmm. for this particular podcast is how do we bring these two things together? On one hand, what are the minimum requirements that um, a venture capital fund that declares itself to be ESG compliant would have to, uh, to, uh, to do in order to qualify? So that's, that's the big question, because given the fact that, you know, out of the five intentions, we only quote unquote uh, address the first two climate change and uh, climate adaptation, there is no circular economy and so on, which could lead to something like you were saying, uh, you know, having a water power plant, you know, kill the biodiversity just because, uh, but it would qualify for some other criteria. So as a venture capital fund, and we need to get going, how do you aggregate the money? How do you measure and how do you declare yourself? Uh, how would the institutional investors make the decision to invest or not invest in, in an in a ESG VC fund? I, I would say, first of all, it, it, all, it, it all starts with the quality of your investee companies and do the investee companies have something to say on some environmental goals. It doesn't even have, from my perspective, don't, uh, they don't even have to be the, um, the EU uh, environmental goals, but I would take them because they're there and we've got this instrument taxonomy and probably some other taxonomies coming. So you may be on a good footing there to, to use them and look at them. So your investee companies should fall into that category, first of all. Uh, 
second, second, um, and, and, and in order to increase a better uptake, uh, my business school, Gizma Business School, is conducting the kind of workshops with entrepreneurs and with students where we, where we use design thinking methods and some, some, some other collaborative tools in order to, to get them into a mode of thinking where even thinking out of the box, it becomes the norm. Um, this is not, this is not uh, so easy because many of the young entrepreneurs uh, they do not understand, as we would probably do, understand technology as a means to an end. But to them, tech, technology by definition is sexy. So anything that's technological is sexy. Whereas uh, if you, if you, uh, even if, if if you're an investor from that perspective, it does have to produce a payback. It does have to have some sort of impact. I know your your the impact is probably not the most friendly term to use. <laughs> context but it, it's got to have some impact and uh, that's what technology is, is about so at the same time when i look at the let's say the constructive principles of a venture fund it should from my perspective very closely follow the eu taxonomy or some other taxonomy but anyway something like a i was going to say rock solid there's nothing rock solid here but as solid as possible uh benchmark to use in order to qualify and make sure that the investments you have in your portfolio are really uh, green or whatever ESG sustainable uh, in the sense that they, A, they have a purpose that is sustainable and B, the way that the business is conducted is uh, sust sustainable per se or green or whatever you want to call it. So it, I would say the underlying principle, the constructive mechanism must be some hard benchmark, which could be a taxonomy. Um, now, as far as uh, I, I have uh, not too much insight into the venture capital industry, but uh, there was a point in time a couple of years ago when I looked into sustainable infrastructure. And uh, part of what happened to the sustainable infrastructure uh, uh, industry projects that were being offered was that often investors thought that they want, didn't want to be the first ones to invest. They wanted didn't want to be, you know, who wants to be as Tversky and Kahneman, right? As pro, uh, prospect theory, who wants to be the loser, you know, if it fails? Uh, but there's always got to be the first one. Um, now, I'm not sure whether what, what kind of means a venture cap capitalist has, but uh, perhaps um, one access or entry point is to have on the side of the venture capitalist their own. Uh, ESG force of people who are savvy in ESG or sustainability who can actually produce the kind of level of certainty that you need to have in order to, to know I can go into that investment even though I'm the first one to invest. Um, by and large, I'm, as a, again, I cannot speak about the venture capital industry, but the, the conventional investment industry despite all you read and hear about ESG here and there, ESG in every web page, is still very much short on good knowledge about um, ESG. There's a lot of far too much reliance on some of the data providers. And I'm, I'm personally not, I don't want to criticize any professional data provider, but if you come across a spec sheet of a new KPI that's called climate warming factor and the explanation cannot even be understood by someone who's uh, who's got a PhD in rocket science I've but everyone is using it that is sort of that makes me that, that I find personally find a little scary so that's got to be we need to build up the acumen um, and and at the end of the day isn't it isn't it an easy question um, venture capital uh, is asking the question what is what are the what are the criteria what are the characteristics of a good company? that are investing at a very early point in time when there is no track record, when there's probably no product, but there is something like the management quality that I can invest in. So we seem to have an understanding. So uh, judging on the quality of a business model, especially a business model that is geared towards the EU taxonomy, uh, that should be possible. Or am I wrong here? Well, I, I am the example that it is possible. We've done it for the past 30 years. The question is, let's say you, you personally, Professor Rolf Frank is head of a pension fund. 
what are based on which criteria would you be willing to invest 50 million into a ESG venture fund? Mm. That is that is a tough question. And uh, first of all, it's it, I'm I'm in a regulated business. That is the first thing. Then secondly, let's assume uh, I have been I have not been the bravest person in the world for the last 30 years like you. So I've been different. I've always played the safe bets. Uh, but let's just let's not make this caricature. De facto, the um, we all know this is inve pure investment theory that um, that investments in equity, be it traded equity or listed equity or non-listed equity, is the most profitable investment you can make. At the same time, it's, it is very, very volatile. It can be very volatile. So and we all know there's this, there's this strange relation between volatility and profitability that is in every textbook. Um, but in, in none of the textbook is a set that you should, you need to decide whether you are more into uh, risk averseness or risk pro and whether you go for volatility rather um, or whether you should just go for, for bonds, you know, and sobbies. Uh, and service and corporate bonds. So the whole industry, the the pension fund industry, institutional investors are very risk averse. And so uh, the 50 million that you asked for, I would probably invest if I have, what, you know, two or three billion to invest total assets under management. Um, Given that I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not propagating here, and I'm not uh, saying this is the way it should be. But uh, from experience and from looking at the industry, we know that the industry is very conservative with the small C, and is very, very risk averse. And um, that's th that's the reason why they're in that mess. Because if you've promised your beneficiaries over the years six percent interest rate on the investments, and now you're hardly beating inflation, you're you're in trouble. That's that's for sure. And 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 that is probably not the right uh, kind of business situation in which you uh, invest into uh, something that looks at first glance risky because it is volatile, uh, uh, disregarding the fact that. In the situation you're in, you exactly need the kind of volatility in order to produce profits. You know, it's, it's, it's simple investment math, if, if, if you want. Um, I would wish we had more, um, more uh, pension funds who would actually uh, invest in, in, in non-listed early stage equity. Yeah. And it's we've got all the we've got all these in investment know-how at hand. I mean, it is already in the market. Some people do it. You do it. Some some people practice it. So it it, it can be done. The problem is just that it isn't done at scale. And that is, seems to be part of the problem. The majority of pension funds have an equity uh, proportion of something. Well, it's probably five six percent. It feels like zero percent. Uh, that is that that is a shame and even those large scale pension funds we once knew like uh from the hermes family in the uk or railpan or so they they have actually come down from from an equity uh, ratio of something from 80 75 to 80 percent down to something like 20 25 percent the whole market has gone risk averse and has disinvested from equities that is, seems to me I'm, I'm 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 fully aware that i'm describing a problem here without giving you a solution sorry yeah you're just saying what is known we have now a different situation with the eu financing sustainable growth uh, initiative uh, which needs to be, it needs to it needs to work out there, there is one of the promises that the us the us made is um that they want to redirect capital flows, you know, and uh, that is one of the three overarching goals they have put in front of the um, of the uh, EU action plan. Uh, now, uh, the question is: Will we see more capital inflows into into green and sustainable uh, uh, technology, especially? Uh, I, I I believe it'll take some time. It, uh, let's. Let's hope, but let's let's also be patient and and not forget it'll take some time. This these these risk averse markets have been like that for the last thirty years, and they're not going to change overnight. I believe. 
yes, in the in the past, <clears throat> venture capital has been only risky, but now we do have to manage risk associated with climate change, which is a de-risking, an additional de-risking criterion for any investment. So that would, in my view, and according to Integral Investing, actually support the de-risking that is in the past associated with climate change. And you and I have known that uh, all along that ESG is actually reducing the risk and increasing uh, the safety for the financial return if you decide to use it. It's not costlier. And all the research shows that uh, that's the case. Anyway, no, so- No, it's not. I, I absolutely agree. And then something else that you might want to say that um, if you take a closer look at the concept of double materiality, uh, what it clearly says is you might feel safe with some of the investments you've taken, but you're not safe at all. Because if, if a risk hits you, it, it's going to hit you hard because you've actually, you've, uh, you've, you've got too much risk of a specific kind of the kind that you shouldn't have in your books. And that's also something that is often, often forgotten. Up to the fact that um, uh, I personally see a stewardship role in investors that I see that is being fulfilled by venture capital investors, but often not by the large scale asset managers who rather than selling the, the brown stuff that they have in their books with the question, why do they have it in their books anyway? Um, they should actually engage with the companies and not just sell it off because if they sell it off, some other uh, investors will buy it. So it will remain in the market and nothing is a zero sum game, basically what's, what's being played. That, that, is, that is also something that you might say about the investment industry. Not well understood, probably, it's, it's probably, uh, is probably understood, but not not uh, you know, taken into account at all. Some some big biggies like BlackRock sort of keep uh, referring to it, uh, but it's, it's it's as true as anything. You know, if if, if if there are there are business out there in this world which shouldn't be financed at all, it should rather be changed by someone who has a say, which is an investor in a stewardship position. Right, you've been very. Generous with your time. Thank you so very much. I, last question. We started with what motivated you to embark on this journey. Last question. How do you want to be remembered? <laughs> oh, I, I, have, I have spent a lot of um, hours, I'd say, on the question, how do you get ESG into good investment decision making? And I'm still looking at it today um, from different perspectives. And sometimes when I teach my students, I, uh, I cannot help it. I just give them an investment thing to work on. Although many are actually not experienced with finance at all. So I want to be remembered as someone who paved or helped to pave the way a little bit better to get ESG topics into mainstream investment decision-making. Wow. Well. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good, that's a good goal. So thank you so very much for your time and uh, insight, insights and um, wisdom nuggets. Uh, thank you for participating in this program and uh, I'm looking forward to our next conversation. Uh, so do I, Mariana. Thanks for having me on your program. Thanks for asking me the question. Enjoyed every minute of it and uh, my pleasure. Talk soon. Take care. Stay safe.